subject here is going to be oh, she's very broad, so that gives us a chance to have a little bit of fun as well, hopefully. Uh, we were due to start 15 minutes ago. I'm amazed we're only 15 minutes late. <laughs> Anyone that puts John Weinberg on a panel is asking for trouble. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so well done, John, for keeping it uh, only 15 minutes over. Um, so I'm going to do an introduction to the panel, and then um, just to set you up for this, I'm going to ask you to tell everyone in the room what you're working on at the moment and what's exciting you within the VR space. So you have a couple of minutes to think about that while I tell everyone who you are. Um, so firstly, closest to us, you've already met Matt Bin, uh, did a lovely talk earlier. I'm not going to tell you anything more about him, because he's already done it. But I did look at his LinkedIn profile. He's funny, bearded, and passionate. <laughs> so let's have that coming through in a second before we... Uh, dive in a little bit deeper. And we've also met Simon. Um, and Simon, uh, your seat is incredible with the products that you've worked on. Very, very impressed. Delighted to have you here and your expertise. Particularly interested in your Vector VR, so we might get onto that in a second and find out what that's all about. Uh, next along we have Simon Harris. Sitter Miller from Supermassive Games now. Uh, Simon has worked for Microsoft for Electronic Arts and is today executive producer at Supermassive Games. For those who don't know who they are, which I'd be amazed if you don't, they're a BAFTA winning independent game developer with a particular um, renown for innovation in storytelling and VR. Their hits include the PS4 title Until Dawn, working uh, progress projects at the moment, Bravo Team, and The Impatient on PS. VR, some great E3 trailers that came out from Supermassive. Uh, one further on, we have Jonathan Newth, um, formerly CEO of Kuju PLC, one of the UK's largest games companies. Jonathan has, well, according to his profile, at least three jobs today. There's probably more. <laughs> None of them three I'm aware of. Uh, he's a director of indie publisher Chilled Mouse. He's also involved in Tenchi Partners as a director. And really, uh, well, we've got you on the panel here today, is the CEO of Focal Point VR. They're building a socially enabled live stream VR platform which teleports players to remote locations, sporting events, music venues, etc. Um, and immerses them in full 360 video and audio with an experience they can share with friends. That sounds thoroughly nice. Good thing to do. <laughs> and at the far end, uh, Steve Watt, who is the design manager for End Dreams. Now, Steve always wanted to be a game designer. That's true. Apparently. Um, his uh, studies took him into PhD in Artificial Intelligence, and he also worked at Electronic Arts and Microsoft, but also a stint at Codemasters and Stardoll. As a design manager of End Dreams, uh, they're the makers of the Assembly and Bloody Zombies. So that's your panel today. Great diverse backgrounds. And firstly, just starting with you, at being at the closest end, do we have the microphone? Actually, we're going to start at the other end, because Steve, Steve's got the microphone. Um, Stephen, what are you working on at the moment in VR? Excite the crowd with what you're up to. Um, lots of things, lots and lots of things. Uh, mainly at the moment, it's um, new concepts. So uh, in VR, there's lots of opportunity for innovation and creating new concepts. So I'm doing it with my friend over there, the art director of um, End Dreams, and um, yeah. So we sit there a lot of the time, coming up with new concepts and pitching them to big businesses and, and first party. Um, also, I'm sort of because I, the head of the design at End Dreams, so I'm also, also sort of mentoring the designers, recruiting designers, and looking at the overall strategy um, for End Dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you've given a pretty good description of the platform that we're building. So oh, we'll move I'll, on then, if you I'll, I'll just take take 30 seconds to okay. talk about the problems we're solving. So this was talked about earlier in terms of the experience lots of new users for VR have. They stick a headset up and they go, well, that looks a bit rubbish. You know, I can see lots of pixels, it's a bit fuzzy. Um, what we're aiming to do is build a platform that when someone puts a headset on, they actually believe they're somewhere else. They have the feeling of presence where their mind and their body viscerally fools them thinking they are somewhere else. And there are a number of challenges around that. One is resolution, um, and that's the not the to see the pixels. The hardware is going to address that problem this year, in fact, and certainly in the next couple of years, we'll get towards retinal resolution. Um, in order to deliver video at that resolution, there are some serious challenges in terms of data rate we're addressing. But more importantly, VR has to have a sense of place in 3D, uh, which means depth, again, which was talked about earlier. So the key research we're doing is on depth enhanced uh, video streaming. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so Supermassive Games, 
think the thing we're most excited about is just the fact that it's a completely new frontier. You know, there's, um, as Steve will know and others will know who design, and as Simon was talking about earlier, you know, the preconceptions you come to this, especially those that have been working in the industry for quite a few years, are, are just so wrong. You have to relearn everything. We're going to continually develop new ways of delivering experiences and stuff Jonathan's talking about, you know, the, the concept of actually delivering retinal level um, video streams is, is pretty amazing. Um, so that's what's exciting us. We're really busy at the moment, as, uh, as uh, Sam did a great job of reading out my bio, we're working on a couple of titles um, that are going to be released later on this year for Sony PlayStation VR, which are Bravo Team, a co-op first person shooter and uh, the inpatient which is our foray into taking our storytelling expertise um, that we honed in until dawn um, and we're now doing a vr prequel to until dawn um, and alongside that we've got a couple of other things we haven't yet talked about so uh, we're, we're a multi-platform studio so uh, we're not uh, just focused on playstation vr Thanks. Um, we're working on a number of VR projects at the moment some of which are on the more corporate end of the scale and some are more on the entertainment side but um, a couple that I would pick out. One is the project that we're doing with the University of Surrey and the Foundry, which is a, a cinematic VR experience, because I think that um, we've probably all heard about Hollywood getting very interested in VR, but we have yet to really see what they're going to do with it. And um, one of the things that excites me more than anything about VR is that we are all, if we're doing something in VR, we're all at this part of the wave, and it hasn't done that yet. And I know I was one person kicking myself for not getting on the apps wave and thinking, God damn it, I missed that opportunity. But with VR, I feel like we're all at the beginning of the opportunity and we've yet to see what it's going to do. So that's fantastic. And the, other, the other piece that we're working on at the moment involves taking people into VR. So almost the opposite side of the problem I was talking about earlier in terms of um, making realistic characters, actually putting you, the player, into VR in a way where you recognise yourself and other people around you. Um, which I think is one of the major challenges. We have an awful lot of people telling us VR's been and gone, and now it's all about AR. And that's probably because they haven't actually tried AR yet. Um, <laughs> and, and I actually think there's a solution in the middle, which is to put people in VR, so you can get all of the spectacular benefits that VR has over AR, and, um, and really exploit that. So that's one of the things we're working on. Cheers. What excites you then, uh, we're working on a few projects like Kinema well, I should be saying that's clients are, so I can't really diverge too much. But for, for me and for us, I Kinema Orion, which is our HTC Vive motion capture system in your home solution, is probably the, is what's exciting me right now because you can have full body in a game and you can't really get more immersive than your entire body in a game. And that's really it for me. That's what's really exciting, just the immersion in virtual reality and the possibilities that can bring. So um, we've all been very positive. I'm going to lower the tone a little bit, I'm afraid. You know, we've all heard some great stuff so far from all the speakers. We've been very positive. Apart from the access to finance route, which I totally agree with. Um, what are the, I'm really interested in what the barriers are, because sometimes you have to look at the worst case scenario to work out how to surpass that and move on. So, um, so starting with you, Advin, because you've got the microphone. And uh, do you want to set us off what are the barriers to growth in VR, either within your particular sector or the industry in general? What are the barriers to VR growth? In, in our... Sorry. In our... Uh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in our industry, uh, I think, especially in the tracking industry and motion capture industry, the most challenging part is probably getting good tracking in virtual reality. Because otherwise, if your hand's going, say, this fast, but I'm um, going this way, this fast, but instead your character in virtual reality is going 10 times slower, you're going to get sick, you're going to take it off, and you're never going to go try it out again. And I think one of the big things we need to focus on is probably the tracking, which will cause a massive issue for a lot of people who do get easily motion sickness or uh, simulation sickness. And in the entire industry, it's probably just the expectations. The amount of people who think VR is like, the guys on the panel said, it's, they expect it to be real life. It's not, it's a, it's a starting point, and maybe in a few years it will be something like that. But. We just need to manage expectations, really. 
Um, yeah, the technology itself, well, I think we all know it's not where it needs to be yet, but it's a bit cliche to talk about that too much, uh, you know, from my perspective. I'd actually talk about a problem that I think we're lucky enough to not have, uh, which is how you make money out of VR. And I, that's not to say we make loads of money, but it's, it's to say that we have a market which doesn't need to have a headset and a, and a massive PC or, or a, a VR enabled PlayStation or whatever. We don't need that market for what we do. So we're very lucky in that respect. And I think that for a lot of the innovation which will naturally come out of the kind of work that the people in this room will do, they probably do need that market to be commercially successful. And um, so I think that one of the one of the barriers for seeing that explosion of innovation is actually being able to deliver to a wide enough market. I'm not the one to answer whether that market is growing quickly enough or not, and I'm keen to find out from others. Um, but I'm, I feel very lucky that we don't have to work in that area and, and worry about those things because of the nature of the business that we have and the kind of clients that we work with. Do so you mean specifically the entertainment market? Yes. Uh, not delivering what perhaps people are expecting and you can't make money out of it? Well, I, I, like I said, I'm not really qualified to say whether you can or you can't, but I, I certainly feel very lucky that we don't have to have, have that concern because we work in a very different market. You know? But I imagine it's holding a few people back at the moment. Well, someone will ask you if you're making any money out of the RNSF, but what are the, what are the barriers that Sorry, if we move along. What are the what are the barriers that you're saying at the moment are super massive? Um, I mean, I think there's there's a lot of there's a large number of barriers. I'm just going to pick one, which I think is currently the use case. We don't have um, a reason for the general public who don't know anything about games to go and try VR yet. It's not there enough. Mobile is. Mobile is chipping away at it. Games on, you know, the home consoles are chipping away at it because um, people are going, oh yeah, I've just invested that and price is another thing, you know, I've invested in one, get their friends around and play it. But until we, until we start seeing a reason um, for people to do something that they do every day, and this is why Facebook's involvement is so interesting, but, you know, until that real use case for general public comes along, we're still going to be talking about a niche market. So we're about killer app, we need some kind of thing, but we're talking about other things as well, sort of more day-to-day -day general use, which is very interesting. Uh, Jonathan Barrett, what are, what are the Yes, yeah, so, so uh, for Obvious to succeed, we need 500 million odd headsets out there in regular use, and I'm certainly relying on the games industry and everyone in this room to build the content to drive the uptake of hardware so that we can um, sell our more mass market, um, lighter touch uh, technology. Uh, however, sharing, uh, sort of thinking about this, sharing an insight over 25 odd years of creating games, um, some commercially very successful, some complete failures. Um, one of the key things that it took us a few years to understand was it's vitally important to not only be able to predict, which is not hard, but get into the heads and the minds of those behind and owning platforms to understand what drives them what their ultimate end game for their platform is, how their platform is engaging with consumers. Um, and if you're able to do that, then you can create content that works on a platform. Now, VR is a platform. What it lacks is a killer app. The successful platforms, if you look back over consoles and other games platforms, have all had a number of pump priming killer apps. And almost without uh, exception, those have been funded by the platform holders. That's what currently Oculus and the other major VR platform players are not doing. They're engaging with developers, they're providing some support, but they're not putting the money or the effort or the focus into creating those killer apps which are required to drive mass market uptake of the hardware. Cheers. Um, actually, just before uh, my answer to the question on the barriers, I just want to sort of just highlight actually how exciting VR is in the sense that it is a brand new medium. It's not games in the same sense. It has, it, it's not books and it's not film. If, if I take like the Fire of London, for instance, yeah, what I learn from the experience of reading a book about the Fire of London is different to what I learn about watching it in a theater or watching it on film. And it's different to what I would learn about the Fire of London in playing a video game and VR has that special property of that presence and immersion that we all know about and we're harking on about all the time because it's so true that for the, for, for the 
this this medium has the first it's the closest to that first hand experience that you can get so you know thinking about a dinosaur for instance coming towards us i can read about that but it's not the same in vr i sort of go broad shoulders and the hair sticks up on on my so so there are barriers as you as everyone's been talking about but the rewards are massive and those rewards are known by these big tech companies. Um, and so they're continuing to invest in VR because they want to solve it. The, you know, so the barriers of screen resolution, latency, wide headsets, having it on your head, the, the weight of it, the isolation, all of these are actually getting solved one by one because people want this solved because they realize, yeah, just how powerful this new medium is. Um, yeah, I think. I should just go a new barrier actually. The, the, the two beer bottles sound cheating against each other as a barrier to keeping your mind on the panel that's in front of you. Um, but we will plow on. I'm going to make you wait a little bit longer for your, uh, for your uh, alcohol. Um, now, we've been trying where possible to link questions and panels to the local area around here. and. Uh, what we've heard is that, that Guildford is this, this hotbed for games development, even though the Indies don't start work till 10.30 in the morning, um, they're still putting some great content out there. I should probably ask you what time you lot start, see if the VR lot are different from, uh, from Indie Studios. But, um, you know, here we are focusing on Guildford and we've got some great companies here. Guildford seems to be a hotbed, hotbed for VR and technological development in general. Do any of you have any particular views on why that is the case? Or are we deluded? I mean, is, is it actually the case? And if so, why is that the case? And then we heard it earlier with the history and the pedigree. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely true that this is a hotbed of talent. Um, there's loads of people here, loads of friends I know. You know, I've worked at Criterion, I've worked at uh, Microsoft, and I've worked at um, Codemasters all here. So there are lots of friends here. So it's great that you can sort of turn up in a university as well that's supporting our industry. So. You know, we just go down the pub and chat about different well, concepts. Why is that particular for VR? Is there any particular reason why? Or is it just a symptom of being lots of games created around? Uh, uh, yeah, I think why for VR in particular is because at the moment VR is actually developing from the film industry and also from the games industry. Um, actually, I think it's a, a, a thing that's got to be overcome. Um, it's, it's, VR has to stand on, on its own two feet, but obviously we're interactive software developers, and so it makes sense that it's coming from, from these industries. But as I sort of said, VR is its own medium, and we have to learn how to educate the audience, the game reviewers. It's not game in that sense, games across all, um, it's, you know, games in sport, games in books, games in films. It's, um, but VR is its own thing and it's early days for VR, you know, like the, um, like the internet and like the uh, mobile phone and the mobile games, this is the time actually to start to get into this because it's a brand new industry with real fresh opportunities and we're lucky that Guildford is a gaming, in, uh, gaming um, town and so there's lots of people who share the same interests and also the same skills. I think a lot of this has already been said on the previous panel. I think one thing I reflect on, um, the nature of the, the Guildford Games Hub, is a lot of the games, a lot of the companies tend to be more tech rather than creative led. Um, and I think that plays to certainly earlier, early VR type games. Um, from my perspective, nearly all the companies we work with, creative and tech, are actually based in London. Um, so okay. there's, there's a lot of stuff going in London. London's only 45 minutes from Guildford, which is, helps. And the funds are better, are here. They are. I think the, the reality is, um, if we're honest about it, is we look for the trends, you know, from a business point of view, from a creative point of view, you know, um, Simon mentioned it earlier on when you said you, know, you were pissed you missed the mobile app thing. So there are lots of companies, there are lots of developers jumping on this because they're hoping it is going to be the next big thing. Uh, and those of us that are working in it believe there is, and so that's it. And then I think the reason Guildford survives, though, is that meeting of minds that the other panel talked about, that, that 
the success of, of getting so many people in such a small area collaborating and bringing their own perspectives and intelligence to it and, and sharing that. And so that's, that's why we then step out and succeed as opposed to just small collectives of, of people who are also following the same business trends. I mean, you talk about the, the closeness. You've got this street called Walnut Tree Place. You know, there are tons and tons. Figment, we know are there. Hello, Games there for a while. Ubisoft, Polystream, Educate. They're all there. It's a very good place to go. We need more of those, don't we? I, I would say from a company that's not just a games company that um, something some people may not realise is that there's quite a lot of uh, production people based in this area, uh, by which I mean film and TV production people. And... <coughs> Part of that is something that wasn't mentioned earlier that I'm kind of surprised wasn't, which is that Guildford's well nice. Yeah. And, and that has a big draw for people. And I mean that in a serious way because people go and do their time in Soho, they do their time in London, and then when they start to get over it, they want somewhere nice to go. And they either choose St Albans or they choose Guildford on the whole. And so we get the great benefit of the fact there's a lot of people who've decided to have a family or to step back from the London thing, and they tend to move somewhere like Guildford. And Guildford has a lot of that going on and I think the reason why VR is very strong here is because, certainly from our perspective, we need those guys. You know, from up for us, VR is a melding of film work and games work, essentially. And there are more film guys here than a lot of people realise. Uh, a lot of the guys that work with us on some of the stuff I was showing earlier are currently up doing work on the new Star Wars movie and, and doing other bits in Soho, but they prefer to ride the bike into work rather than the bike to the station to then go and touch to London. So. You know, having people here is a valuable thing. Oh, so an interesting strategy, destroy some all burns we get. <laughs> <laughs> I thought of that. Uh, everything's really been said. To right, Abby, we'll be on to the next question then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is the final one. We've had one thing though. Oh, yes, go on. Yes. One thing I have seen is, even though Guildford is a major place for films and games, it's if you're not from Guildford and you're from the industry, you have no idea. This is a thing that I've been, uh, I've been asked by students, by people who work in other industries that go, why is Guildford so popular with films and games? And honestly, I don't, I've never been able to give them a solid answer, but I don't think the reason why Guildford's so popular is what we should be focused on, but it should be how we keep it popular, how we keep the creative talent and the, technic and the tech talent coming in. So that we can take over St. Albans and get everyone to know. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll try and encapsulate that in a Guildford Games Festival. That's the idea, John, genius. And uh, oh, we can do that, no problem at all. Um, very, very finally, very uh, quick answer if you don't mind. We heard a reference to people suggesting that VR in fact was dead already and that AR is the future. Uh, very short answers. Is there life in VR? Should we all be looking at AR? Is there space for both? What's, what's the future for, for that particular battle between those two? Or is there no battle in that? There's no battle. VR ain't dead. Uh, VR is at the bottom, it's just starting out, and AR is a complete, is kind of a different market sense. People need it for different things, so both can live together peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why one has to win or one has to lose. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, they can all just live um, um, just together, really. Um, it absolutely does my head in that VR and AR get grouped together so regularly because they are so different from each other. And yet, I can go to a lot of meetings with people to discuss VR and AR together uh, and then tease out which one it is they really need or really want. But they are completely different from each other and, and people don't seem to get that at the moment, which is weird. But um, yeah, hopefully we'll all get over it and we'll be able to live peacefully. Why are we talking about AR and VR? What about XR and MR <laughs> and the other things I've heard? I mean, but at least we can only get to 26 variations, so it's not bad. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a future. I think this is all about just delivering great experiences. AR does one thing, VR does immersion. Um, we'll work out what other things we can do with that, and it'll be really great fun. There's not been enough disagreement on this panel, so I'm going to say AR and VR are fundamentally the same thing, or will be in 10 years. <laughs> so the, the challenge for um, making the two say the same thing is the ability to, to render black. Um, that's the ability to have an AR experience where actually you can block off things, um, which ultimately create something completely immersive in VR. So um, Samsung and Google, um, and I think another couple of tech companies, have recently put out a number of patents um, for contact lens based displays with cameras which will be powered from uh, the human body, they're 
in prototype form already. So give it 10 years time and you'll have contact lenses you can wear which will allow you to be completely immersed in a VR experience or have the perfect AR holographic experience. They're the same thing, we just need to wait quite a long time. Um, just to be um, on your side actually and, <laughs> and join it. I, I do actually think um, there is a, a middle ground between AR and VR. I think um, VR does suffer from, at the moment, suffers from problems of isolation. Putting on that headset can feel very isolating. We're all used to dual screening now. And so I think there's, you know, the audience aren't, you know, it, it's a lot to sort of take yourself out of this world and put yourself into, and immerse yourself fully into the VR world. Lots of benefits from doing that, but it's quite a lot to ask, ask people to do that. Um, and I think actually there's no reason why you can't blend the two together. So for instance, if you are interested in dual, dual screening and like you're used to having your Twitter feed in there, there's no reason why you can't incorporate that into your VR product in a, in a cool way. Um, one of the other isolation problems could be, you know, you're scared of walking into the furniture in your house. There's no reason, <laughs> there's no reason again why you can't sort of convert your furniture and incorporate that into the game and the two blend. It's about, yeah, it's about sharing new, fresh, cool experiences and they're both brilliant. So thank you very much, uh, our panel. Can you put your hands together and thank you.